I don't actually want to make the Crash Bros cry, but I did get a moist towelette for the ones that I do make cry when they watch this video. Because for a few years, at least a decade, but mostly for the last few years, since some of the Crash Bros channels really took off, every couple of days, the Crash Bros are making a video on why the real estate crash is about to happen. It's two months away, 40% crash by the summer. Prices are reducing in the winter, like they do every single year. And you should wait to buy. And there are people who say this quote, and I've heard this quote since I was a kid. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Everybody always forgets the second half of that statement. The richening continues. The rich get richer, and the poor get poorer by choice. This is something that we do by choice. And then you'll see people talking about the middle class is disappearing. The middle class is going away. And most people don't realize that you don't want to be in the middle class. The middle class is who pays for everything. Almost all of the taxes that people think um, of are paid by the middle class. Yes, the top one or 2% pay the bulk of our taxes, but that's because of the businesses that they own. When we look at income tax, 44% of Americans didn't pay any income tax, 44%. But a lot of the people in the lower income that don't pay taxes get a lot of benefits from the taxes. I'm just gonna list a couple. Housing subsidies, section eight food stamps, state medical, child daycare subsidies. We had employees at the company that I ran for the last decade who made a certain amount of money. And when we went to give them a raise, they said, no, don't do that. If you do that, I lose this benefit and this benefit and this benefit. So they refused the raise because if they got moved closer to the middle class, they would lose benefits and pay more taxes. The people who earn income in that middle class usually are paying taxes at a really high level because they're paying earned income tax. It's a high percentage of their income. When you move into assets that pay you, when you become an investor, you actually pay less taxes. I recommend the book Cash Flow Quadrant by Robert Kiyosaki. Uh, it explains one of the main reasons why you want to go from employed or self-employed over to business or investor so that you'll pay less taxes. So when people say, the middle class is shrinking. I want you to understand that it is shrinking, but it is often by choice. Here is an image of the middle class shrinking. 1971 versus 2021. Yes, there are more poor people. It went from 25% to 29% for the lower income people. So it went up 4%. The increase of wealthy upper income people went from 14 to 21 percent. It increased by 7 percent. And at 14, that means it went up by 50 percent as far as volume goes. So while the middle class is shrinking, that's true. Some people are getting poorer, but more people, 4 percent moved from middle class to lower income, 7 percent moved from middle class to upper income. So when you hear people saying the middle class is going away, remember, the richening continues. More people are becoming wealthy. So I'm going to talk about a very specific example. I'm going to use myself because I know the numbers on how the poor and the middle class can move to that upper income and how they can become richer due to some things you don't even control that will impact you. And I know some people that are here this early in the live stream are usually the people who are familiar with my content. So I'm going to keep this to, if I can, less than a 30 second to a minute blurb on where I started. So picture the 2008 housing crash, the recession that hit. I was a police officer for about eight years, got laid off. A bunch of qualified officers got laid off at the same time. I was a single parent with three kids, found out about $89,000 in bad debt in my name that I didn't know existed until the divorce. I started teaching people how to drive trucks at a CDL school making $17 an hour. So that was my position. Bunch of bad debt, $17 an hour, three kids to raise. That puts me in that lower income bracket. But by some choices that I made, I reached financial freedom and I retired last year. 
at the age of 52, because I started investing at 40, reached financial freedom in about eight years, worked for four more years because I loved the job. I loved teaching at the CDL school. I was demoted all the way down to president of the company, and I enjoyed my job. But I ended up retiring because time freedom was more important to me. But here's just a couple of the things that in the next year are actually going to make the richening continue more. My goal isn't to say, look what I've done. My goal is to say, look what you can do. You can make choices right now that will put you in the same position I'm in in a couple of years. If your position is as bad or worse, maybe five years. But if your position isn't as bad, maybe you make more money. Maybe you don't have all the bad debt you didn't know about until the divorce. Maybe you're not raising three kids on your own income. Maybe there's two of you in that relationship. I purchased cash flowing assets in the last decade. I house hacked. I saved for a couple of years, bought a duplex, lived in one side, rented out the other, saved for another couple of years, bought another duplex. The income snowball kicked in around five or six years and things started to happen faster. And what I want to talk about is owning those cash flowing assets. In 2020, when we had the pandemic, an eviction moratorium and a uh, stock market crash of 30% in March of 2020, and a bunch of videos started screaming, the crash is coming, real estate's going to crash, it's going to be worse than 2008, you still see those videos today. Every two days, they make a new video on the same subject, but this time it's different. The Three years now, every other day, hundreds and hundreds of videos on the crash that's right around the corner that hasn't happened yet. If I had listened to them, I wouldn't have bought any more real estate. I would have sat and waited for the crash. When they say things like, when interest rates come down, you'll be able to buy. Well, interest rates went down in 2020. What happened to prices? 2020 in my area, 24% appreciation. 2021, 19% appreciation. 2022, 15.6% appreciation. Because interest rates went down. Well, interest rates went up. Prices are still up. So now you'll be able to buy when interest rates come down. Because what do you think is going to happen to prices now when interest rates go up, when they go down? What happened in 2020? Interest rates went down, so prices went up. If interest rates go down again, prices are going to skyrocket. So I owned a couple of assets, and then in 2020, I purchased another, a fourplex, a triplex, 2021, a duplex. So I added more cash flowing assets to my portfolio. So the first thing that makes the rich get richer and the poor get poorer by choice is we all had access to those Crash Bro videos. But instead of watching them and taking them to heart, I watched one rental at a time. I met and got to know Matt the Lumberjack Landlord and Millennial Mike, and I kept buying cash flowing assets. So what have we had in the last couple of years? Record inflation. The first of at least four things I'm going to talk about. The first thing that is making me richer, the richening continues, is inflation. Inflation means the dollar becomes weaker. Either we printed more of it or it lost value. So it takes more dollars to buy assets or even things that aren't assets, to buy liabilities. It takes more of those dollars. So since it takes more dollars to buy the assets that I own, their value went up because it takes more dollars to buy the assets that I own. Michael Zuber from One Rental at a Time actually has a t-shirt. You can get it at onerentalatatime.com that says, I used inflation to get rich. Ask me how. Here I am explaining it to you. Owning assets when inflation hits makes you richer. That's just the first thing. So we've had record inflation for year after year now for the last three years. It makes it harder to acquire the cash flowing assets. Yes, I get it. It's still possible. There are some changes coming up that actually is going to make it easier for a short period of time. And I'm going to talk about those. And that fourth thing that made me, that is making me richer because the richening continues. The second thing that is making me wealthy is now let's just take out cash flow. My, my cash flowing assets are why I was able to retire because it wasn't a certain amount of net worth or a certain amount in savings because I don't even have retirement accounts. If I had retirement accounts, I would still have to work. But I own cash flowing assets. So let's take the cash flow to the side for a second. Every single month, one of the reasons why I get richer, and I honestly don't know if I'm rich because that definition changes by everybody that you talk to. What I am is wealthy. For me, wealthy is defined by how long can you live, how many months can you live your current lifestyle if you stopped your W-2 job, if you didn't have earned income. And for me, 
It's perpetual. I make over four times what it costs me to live. So I am, in my own mind, wealthy because I don't ever have to work again. Don't know about the rich thing. People define that differently. So every single month, my tenants at my rental properties pay the rent and a portion of that covers principal pay down. And somebody pointed out that I misspelled principal in my video. It's AI. AI does the captions. That's not me typing the words out if you have captions on, which they should be on. If they're not, I'll have to turn them on later. <laughs> so the principal pay down right now, it's over $3,000 a month that my tenants are paying into my mortgages that pays off that portion of the mortgage. So it's like a savings account that grows every month without me having to actively add money to it. But I actually do have cash flow. And here's how it is. The third thing that's actually making me wealthy is this third thing, this cash flow, why it's growing. We had an eviction moratorium. You couldn't kick people out of your, your uh, properties in 2020, and they didn't have to pay the rent. Here's how many late or missing rent payments I had in 2020. Zero. Even if you move the decimal point, zero. I've never had a late or missing rent payment. So during the pandemic, what I had was rents frozen for a year. And then in 2021 and 2022, we saw rent spike because of the pandemic that happened in the eviction moratorium and the added risk to the landlords. The area average rent spiked in my area by about 30 to 40 percent. So I used my binder strategy. You can find that at DionTalk.com. The binder strategy is a way that I keep my tenants happy because happy tenants don't trash your property and they don't leave. Tenant turnover is expensive. Sometimes it's what we want. And I'll talk about that in that number four. But the binder strategy had my tenants ask me to raise the rent. The smallest one was 20%. The biggest one was 28%. So 20 to 28% of a rent increase. There were some added costs. Insurance went up 80%. Property taxes went up 20%. Now, those sound like big numbers, 80%, 20%. It's less than $100 a month per property. But rents went up 20 to 28%. Do the math. If average rents from here are around $2,000, what do you think they increased? So in 20... 22, I invest around Joint Base Lewis McCord. It's one of the largest bases on the West Coast. I also invest in towns that have colleges, and there are college students who receive BAH if they're using the GI Bill. So when the basic allowance for housing, the BAH for the military, whether they're on base or attending college if using their GI Bill, went up 12%. In 2023, that might have been 2023, it's only going up 3% this year, but it's 3% on top of that 12%, which brings up the area average rents. And around JB11, it happened in 2014 or 15, too, where the, the BAH for an E5, so a sergeant, went from like 1400 to 1800 well, Within three months, all rents for that type of house went to at least 1800 because why rent to somebody else when you can get at least that much from the military or a veteran or service member or spouse or dependent attending college using the BAH benefits from their service member in their family? Rents went up because of that. Now we have... Uh, the Housing Authority, Section 8, having one of the biggest year-over-year -year market increases. I'm actually meeting with a tenant tomorrow. We're going to discuss the rent because January 1st, the rents in our area are going up from it's like 2,400 to 3,000. Now, I'm not going to go all the way to 3,000, but I'm going to go up significantly on the rent. We're talking tomorrow because in this state, you have to give 60 days notice. So we're signing a new lease for 2024 that will start January 1st when the new Section 8 rents kick in. A big increase in my income happening because a government agency has an increased budget. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer by choice. I chose to buy rental properties. I chose to have Section 8 tenants. I chose to have military tenants. Here's the really cool thing about the Section 8 program. The portion that the tenant pays is decreasing with this increase to their rent. It's an interesting formula that they use at the housing authority to figure it out, but their income based on the fair market rents that uh, there's a website that I can put in the, the, the chat for you to look at. You can look up your county and your state to see what's happening from 2023 to 2024. There are some where it's only going up five or 10%, but in our area, it's going up significantly. Uh, I think it's 3,000 a month for uh, four bedrooms, uh, which, it's hitting area average rents with Section 8. That's a big increase. 
One of my diversification strategies to be able to sleep well at night, having that SWAN account in my investing strategy, is to have about one third of my tenants with Section 8, one third with military, and one third working and retired. So I'm ready for a pandemic, prolonged government shutdown, or stock market crash. My whole, whole portfolio won't be impacted. So these are the things driving up area average rents. There's one more. I invest, and I say this often, between Olympia and Tacoma in Washington, but not in Olympia or Tacoma in Washington, because I wouldn't know inside a city. I'm not stupid. With remote work happening more now than at any point in our lives, because of the pandemic from 2020, remote work is an option. And yes, there are some companies calling people back to the office, but not very many. And it's usually in the tech industry where they're doing that. Over half, if you take out truck drivers, because I knew a lot from running the CDL school, but over half the people I know work remote jobs. Since people can work remotely, people are moving further out from the city, which is pushing up the rents in the areas that I invest, but not pushing up the home prices. Because people working remotely can't buy. What if their employer forces them to come back to the office five days a week next year instead of two? So rents have gone up because people want to live further out from the city, pushing rents up, increasing the rents again. But this fourth thing is a change that the Lumberjack Landlord talked about on Sunday, and several YouTube channels have covered it. Matt, the mortgage guy, did a really detailed video on one rental at a time, talking about Fannie and Freddie changing the criteria for down payments for small multifamily. My current rental portfolio is 18 units. One of them is a single family house. The rest are duplexes one triplex and one fourplex. So I own all small multifamily except for one single family house that I had before I was an investor. I primarily buy small multifamily. There has always been a certain amount of demand for small multifamily. They cash flow better than single family houses in my area. You can house hack them. You get owner occupied lending with a lower, lower down payment and a better interest rate. But historically, some people would use the FHA loan, which was really hard to buy triplexes and fourplexes with because they had a self-sustainability requirement where the rents, 75% of the rents had to cover all of the expenses. So they had to look at that metric and buy it. And in not in very many areas, would it do that? There was, uh, there's a lot of other reasons why I don't recommend using FHA. To me, it's a bad loan product. It fits certain sis situations well, but it's generally looked at as a first time home buyer loan product. And that's not what it is. It can be used sometimes for a little bit better interest rate, but it's generally designed for somebody with bad credit and a bad debt to income ratio. And that was 3.5% down on all um, single family through four units, but it's harder to get it accepted by the seller because it had to have certain criteria that the sellers didn't think they would meet. So they wouldn't accept the offer. They would even take a lower conventional cash or DSCR loan offer or even a hard money loan offer to buy the property because it was more likely to go through. So there's and, and several reasons why I wouldn't use FHA. The mortgage insurance lasts the length of the loan. So your only ways to get rid of it is pay the mortgage off, refinance, or sell the property. And then you can only have one FHA loan at a time. And if you lived in a duplex and you wanted to buy a fourplex with FHA, if you had FHA, you'd have to refinance out of it because you can only have one at a time. And when you go to buy the fourplex with an FHA loan, the lender can say no. The intent of FHA is not to help people own investment properties. It's to help people own properties who have bad debt to income ratios and bad credit scores. So the person buying the fourplex would have to explain why. Because the FHA loan product wants you to go from a, a four unit to a three unit to a two unit to a one, and then from a one to a bigger one or one that's closer to work or better daycare, better school district or something. So you have to have a reason to do that. If you use a conventional loan, it's easier to get accepted by the seller, doesn't have the FHA requirements, doesn't have the self-sufficiency requirement. You can have more than one. You can have up to 10 in your name, 20 if you're married, and you put one in each of your names as you go. You, mortgage insurance drops away automatically when you hit 22% equity. Fannie and Freddie, starting November 18th, are allowing 5% down on duplex, triplex, and fourplex for owner-occupied loans, which is going to increase the demand and without the self-sustainability or self-sufficiency rule, increase the amounts that you could borrow to buy this, which will also be based off of your income, not just what the property can produce. So if there are people who have decent income and a couple of years rental income and want to house hack a fourplex, 
the amount that you can borrow goes up significantly. Increasing the value of the assets that I already own. Right now, there are some people who don't own assets, and they're here on YouTube University. Possibly they found my channel. More than likely, they're going to find the Crash Bros channel because fear gets clicks. And they're going to watch videos, and they're going to think, the crash is coming right around the corner, so I'm going to wait six months or a year for interest rates to come down, not realizing prices are going to go way up when that happens. Or they're going to wait for something else to, to change, and they're going to miss this window of opportunity. 5% down to buy a small multifamily house. And then in a couple of years, when BAH goes up for whatever reason, when the housing authority finally gets the 2021, 2022 years rolled into their metric for determining rents and the rents go up, when appreciation is caused because we have other things like in an average year, we make a certain amount of homes. This is each decade. So if we go back from 2000 to 2009, we created 27 million new builds, 26 million, 90 through 2000, less than 6 million builds from 2000 to 2010. We've got a serious delinquency in supply and the brilliant people in charge just poured alcohol onto the fire of demand. And speaking of alcohol on fire of demand, I would like to thank the sponsor of today's video, as I have acquired another one, who obviously doesn't sponsor my videos. They just make them possible. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. The richening continues and the choices that you make today, whether you're going to pursue more assets. And that doesn't mean hurry out and buy. Anybody telling you to wait to buy and anybody telling you to hurry to buy needs to be blocked immediately. There are two things that tell you when you should buy your next investment property. And it's not the market. It's not prices. It's not interest rates. And it's not rents. The first thing is, are you ready? That means, mathematically, you have the down payment, closing costs, immediate repairs, source of funding that you're going to use if you're not going to use traditional. And you're ready. You don't have something weird going on in your life, birth, death, divorce, change in occupations. And you've educated yourself on the asset class in the market that you're investing, and you've vetted out your knowledge base to be ready. It's not just the math of having the down payment and closing costs and immediate repairs, but you are emotionally and physically ready because of what's going on in your life to buy. That's the first thing. And the second thing that tells you when to buy, not to hurry and not to wait, but this is what tells you when to buy. And this can happen tomorrow or in two years. When these two things happen, you're ready and you found a great deal. And you're only going to find a great deal if you're doing the work. This is right from one rental at a time. Every day, 15, 20 minutes, look at deals. Run the numbers, build that skill, become confident because confidence comes from competence. And the more competent you are at running the numbers and looking at deals and getting rid of deals that don't make sense and making sure that after math, it hit checks off all the other boxes that makes a good deal because math is just step one and you find all of those other reasons why it's a good deal, then you buy. The richening continues. The middle class is disappearing. And yes, some people are moving from middle class to poor, but there are more people moving from middle class to wealthy. It went up over 50% in the last 40 years. You choose which way you go because you don't want to be the middle class. They pay the most taxes. They work the longest. They are often complaining about the wealthy when they're working so hard for money instead of working smart for money. Because remember, we don't get paid for our effort. We don't get paid for our time. We get paid by, based on results. Thank you for hanging out with my intro. That was 24 minutes. I meant to make it 10. So perfect, nailed it. Uh, I hope that you also make decisions that help the richening continue for you. And yes, I am disappointment in my grammar. If you're new to my channel, my name is Dion. I reached financial freedom in about a decade, starting from a pretty bad, pretty bad position. And my goal now is to help you reach financial freedom, whether it's starting and growing a business, growing it to the point where it's large enough for somebody else to run the day-to-day, 
investing in stocks, using something like the bucket method that Joe Kuhn talks about on the YouTube channel, K-U-H-N, you should check it out. His bucket method, I think, is probably the right way to do it if you're going to invest in stocks, or you can choose to invest in buy and hold real estate the way that I did. All of the ways to financial freedom are right. There's no one right way. There's no wrong way, but there is a one right way for you. My goal isn't to teach you that my way is the best. My goal is to teach you whichever way you choose, it's possible for you. The rest of this live stream is going to be me answering questions that show up in the live chat. I'm here every Tuesday, 4 p.m. Pacific, unless I'm on a cruise, because my fight on a cruise sucks. Don't pay for the internet package, doesn't do you any good. The last one actually blocked YouTube and Prime and Pornhub. But howdy. Bill, I see you were first. Sorry, Dave. Uh, gee, Dion, your optimism for properties is contagious. It is. I've had a few people on Facebook and so in the bigger pockets forums saying, I don't see how 5% down is going to increase demand for, for a small multifamily because it's still a lot of money. There were a lot of people that had that money that were looking at saving until they got to 20% or 25%. I did 20% down on my fourplex, even though it was owner occupied. Uh, 5% down option, because I would never do it in FHA loan. It increases the demand because more people see it as an option. Um, Josh and Mary purchased a duplex, REI Stoners, I believe recently with a 5% down conventional loan. Recently. Do you know how many people in the last year told me you can't buy a duplex with a 5% down over and over and over, but yet several people were doing it? Now, look at how much it hit the news and how much it stormed across YouTube University that Fannie and Freddie are doing 5% down. So even if it isn't for triplex and fourplex, the number of people that are now going, wait, we can do 5% on a duplex again because of all the negatives with that FHA that they don't want. It, it's like Congress is full of people who own real estate that keep making laws that benefit people who own real estate. It's so weird. David and Dave, howdy. I see you're here. You didn't put in third. I'm a little disappointed. Wealth building journey. Good evening, Dion and everyone. Got to be quicker, David and Dave. <laughs> this one's for you, David and Dave. And then a uh, dad joke. So why do seagulls fly over the sea? And I'm guessing Dave answered because they would be bagels if they flew over the bay. My favorite one is I, I grew up in Rosamond, California, middle of the desert. You know, Saugus, California, too. But we used to say, why do the, the birds fly upside down over Rosemont? You know, if you know why. Uh, Frank, howdy, Frank. Looking forward to seeing you guys and, and, and Wealth Building Journey in the course video on Saturday. You know, I'm looking at a new market and wonder if calculating property taxes is, is as easy as going to the specific county and then multiplying the rate times purchase price. Or do you get go to separate house and land like they do for depreciation? What I've done for property taxes is call the county tax assessor and say what equation do you use to assess the taxes? But I like that you said base it on the purchase price because a lot of people will go to the listing. A couple of things they do that I think is kind of incorrect. They'll look at the current rents and they'll think that's what I can base my numbers on. Not learning area average rents using the binder strategy to get just below that. So seeing an increase from where they usually are to run the numbers. But they usually look at what the current property taxes are. That's not what they're going to be in a year or two after you make the actual factual event of buying the property and having a purchase price, something that the county tax assessor can factor. It doesn't immediately make that what the taxes are assessed on because property taxes are assessed on improvements to the property, right? That's the buildings. So they'll usually have a much lower assessed value than what you can actually buy or sell it for. But if you run it at the purchase price, you're going to have very conservative, safer numbers. So I like to do it that way. But I check with the county tax assessor to see what equation they use to find it. Now, sometimes it's very simple. We do 1%, we do 0.75%. But they might have an abacus and tell you a different way that they do it. But that's what I would do. Call the specific markets county tax assessor and ask them how they do it. And let me know how those markets are. We'll talk about them on Saturday. Well, if you want, you can look at them. Oscar, howdy from Fontana, California. I'm very sorry you're in California. Anna, howdy. And Jason and Jada Fresh, howdy. And Jason points out I was first. 
that's not really fair. I kind of had a heads up. Jada, I'm about to start looking for lenders for loans, but I'm at 730 on Credit Karma. And one of the lenders said, usually it's 20 points. That's so 20 to 40 points lower than your FICO. So it would be 710. Should I fix a few collections? I'm sorry, wealth. Uh, Jada, I have then look for lenders with a prime score of 760 or over. Should I just look and apply with my 730 credit score? I don't want to miss this season opportunity here for the first deals on real estate. Is If you have above a 620, I start the conversations with lenders. But if you've been investing for 10 years and you have 30 properties and you're looking for that next property, you're still working on your credit score. It's not something you just stop because uh, you have a couple of rentals. Even if you go to DSCR loans, while they don't look at your work history, your debt to income ratio, your uh, income, they do look at your credit score. So as long as you're above that 620, I'd start the conversation, but be doing the things to improve it. Because by the time between now and when you find the right deal, your credit score might have increased, increased and you're going to shop lenders then anyways, anyway, when you go under contract. Uh, really quick, here's the order of operations on lending. And I actually typed this out on a, a forum this morning. I get pre-approved by a large lender, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, or Chase, because they have the most standardized criteria. If they approve you for something, almost every other lender will give you that much or more as an approval. Once I'm under contract with a property, then I take what that lender offered me, their rate and their cost of buying down the loan, and I share it with at least three other types of lenders. So a broker, guild mortgage, fairway mortgage, credit union, something in your area that can do mortgages, and ask them if they can beat your original lender's offer because you have it in writing, even if it's just email form. If they can't, like my first three purchases, I closed with the original lender. But if they can, you take their better offer back to that first lender to see if they can beat that to keep your business. And it was actually my first uh, Wells Fargo broker who taught me to do this. She said, I can't go to my boss and say, I really like Dion. Can we just give him a better rate? She said, if you bring me something in writing from another lender, I could show my boss that this is what we need to beat in order to keep the business. So that's how I would handle lending. I think you're at the point where you can talk to them and continue to work on your credit at the same time. Dave, I'm sorry, but some of us are still under the oppressive yoke of the nine to five. Four now. Buzz two, howdy. And Chenda, howdy. Ninja Vanish, hello. Chris Garner, welcome to Sunday. Howdy. We are doing a members only live stream this Saturday. Um, I have to figure out the time. Probably three, but it could be like 6 p.m. I'll I'll have it up after after this tonight. I'll put it up so that we know the time that it's there. I'm a teaching assistant for the Bigger Pockets boot camp. If you're in that boot camp, we have the boot the office hours at 2 p.m. Pacific. And I've got the course video at 4 p.m. So it'll be probably after the course video. But we're doing, uh, Curtis, if you, have, if you haven't been to a members only, what it is is it's a Zoom. Everybody can jump in the Zoom. We interact, we talk about things, but mostly it's focused on looking at deals, looking at markets, my deals, your deals. We pull up emails from agents. We look it through and then we go through stream of consciousness, what we would think of that deal and what we would use as a reason to keep doing a deeper dive or a reason to dismiss it as a bad opportunity. Wayne, howdy. Managed to attend your first live here. Well, welcome. I appreciate it. Laura, good evening. Marina, howdy. Chris from Oklahoma. Jason, welcome, Wayne. Curtis, howdy. Long time listener, first time commenter. That's uh, who was uh, Tom Likas. I think it was the first time I heard them say that. All Nighter Hider, howdy. Thank you for showing up. We can start now. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's hard to make the live stuff. I like to do every now and then I'll do a short live, like 10, 20 minutes. I totally get it. It's really hard to stay for a live where I talk for two hours. Um, but I really like these because the questions tell me what kind of content I need to make the shorter content on too. And I've said this before, I'm going to say it in as short a form as possible. One of the reasons I like the live streams is because you're getting the information that an investor, somebody who reached financial freedom, keeps top of mind. If you ask a question and I have an answer, it means I have to think about that. If you ask a question and I'm not sure, or I say I have to have researched that, or um, 
It's a re really detailed question for an attorney or a CPA. It's not something I've had to keep in top of mind because the idea of keeping the information that we have at the top of our mind is when we see a deal, we can make a really quick decision without having to go do research. Tenda, having a hard time finding a tenant for my three bedroom rental. I have priced it lower, matter of fact, lower price and that is it lowest price. Is it because it's slow fall and winter? Is it normal? Any suggestions? Uh, Chenda, I'm going to put my email here. Send me the listing so I can look at it. I did this for a friend this morning, too. Um, I will look at it, give you some ideas on what I might change about it to make it more attractive. Sometimes we will list, and this is a thing that I had, too. I, we list a rental from the perspective of the landlord. We want to know age of building, square footage, things that just don't matter to a tenant. So if you send it to me, I'll look and I'll, and I'll look at the way it's worded, the order of your pictures, things that might not be missed in the pictures. And an example is a lot of people will put in the description, there's washer dryer hookups, but then they don't have a picture of the washer dryer hookups. And when people are looking at a big screen of all these rentals, they're flipping through pictures, not the images, the pictures, not the words. So send it to me. I'll take a look. Before I lowered the rents, I might have offered a concession, half a month's rent free, one full month's rent free, taking that from what a large apartment apartment complexes do before they lower the rent. Um, sometimes lowering the rent does end up being what happens to happen, especially if we research the rent incorrectly. Uh, when you say it's the lowest in the area, what are you comparing it to? Rentometer, which can be flawed. Uh, Zillow, apartments.com, Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, what BAH would get for the military in the area, what Section 8's willing to pay, what they're going to be willing to pay January 1st. Like there's a few things to look at there with the rent. So email me the listing and I'll take a look at it. John, howdy, and Sean. What should you do if you do the binder strategy and they come back with a number lower than what you expect? Don't know if I could do it fast enough here, but that's a whiteboard question. I do have a whiteboard. It's not easy to get to though, but I think, I don't even know if it would show up in the screen. Okay, this happened because of a conversation with Dividend Dave. If you're doing the binder strategy, which is a way to get the tenants to ask you to raise the rent and you wanna to go to deontalk.com forward slash binder, and you'll actually see a free course that I did um, where it, it, I go through all the nuances, how it works with section eight, how it works with property management, how you can do it through email or text or in person. But when you're having that conversation with the tenant and they say, let's look at some numbers. Let's say your rent is, thousand dollars a month area average is 18 so you're 800 less that's generally what happens is you buy a property they're significantly below area average so you want to use the binder strategy first you're not going to do it for a couple of months after you close on a property because you want to bet the tenant you didn't get to run their credit you didn't get to look at their work history you didn't get to look at their eviction records you basically stuck with a tenant i take those two months to figure out if i want to keep them and then if i do want to keep them when you're talking to the tenant and you're doing the binder strategy. Some of us understand the pictures that we're showing the person and they see the numbers on the sheet and they see that rents in the area, if it's area average is 18, you're probably showing them some that are 1750, 1900, 1800, whatever you found, right? The tenant is paying a thousand. So they think, oh, if I go to 1100 or 1200, that's a pretty big increase of one or $200. But right, what do you need to be happy? You want 14 to 1600 without having to do a rehab. Because if you're going to do a rehab, you're gonna kick the tenant out, do a rehab, you're gonna get 1800 or more because you'll be peak rental in the area for ever, area average rents. Make it visual for the tenant. Actually on a piece of paper on the table in front of you, draw a line and say, here's your 1000. That's where you are now. Here's the 1800. <laughs> Left-handed people can't write on a whiteboard because we're pushing, doesn't work. So now you've actually drawn these two out and you can draw a line between here and you can say, here's where you're, here's what you're paying. Here's what area averages. This is what I would get if I had you move out or if you just moved out. You're offering 
a one or two hundred dollar increase. I asked you what was fair. That looks fair to you, but do you see how far off that is from where I would be? So it's a conversation while you're having the binder. It's not, hey, you give the binder and then you accept their offer back, right? So I had I had this one time. It was different numbers. It was like eight hundred. Tenant offered like thirteen or something. And I said the same thing. I said, see how close you are to where you are, but how far away we are from where I would like to be. So then the, that tenant actually came up really high. And I said, that's a great offer. I like that's much better. It's much more fair, but let's go here, right? So if they said 12 or, or from a thousand, they said 11 or 12 and you show this and you settle here, this is your 15 to 16 in here. When the tenant sees it put out like that, then they're actually likely to name the better number because they're not doing it to be cheap. They're doing it because they haven't visualized it yet. <laughs> and now we're going to do this with a broken map for the rest of the video. I'll fix that another day. <laughs> okay. Hopefully that made sense. But that's what I do if they come back with a lower number. I've actually, I still need to make the video with Michelle Myers and my friend Dan, who did the binder strategy with tenants. And the tenant offered too much. Both of them asked for less. Both of the landlords made it less. And then I see that Jada is trying to make me lose sleep forever and ever by taking messages back. Thank you, Dan. Howdy. I would do it, Jada. What was that? I missed something. I don't know. We sleep forever. Tiffany, so true about the remote work. I'm considering moving. I'm considering moving if I can work remotely, which will push up, push up the rent. Angel, howdy. Good to see you here. Uh, Dividend Dave. Royalties for mentioning Dividend Dave. Nice. <laughs> Thank you for the super chat. It is much appreciated. Uh, Dave, drive over here really quick and fix my map. I don't want to do it in the middle of a video. R. Freeman, thanks, Dion. You're a great role model. I have learned a lot from you. Awesome. That is kind of the goal here. Rob, don't drink the Kool-Aid, just the vodka, right? Vodka mixed with Mountain Dew. Jada, does the 5% down help us buy that next house faster after our initial first property? I know you said wait two years to save up 20%, but now with these low changes, to, um, I don't think I said wait two years to do it. I, that's how long it took me to do it. And back, and when I bought that second duplex, it was 20% down because you had to have that at the time. Owner occupied, you can do it sooner. The problem with owner occupied, not the problem, the thing to remember with owner occupied is there's a one year intend to occupy. You have to intend to occupy the, oh, Jada, I know you're, you're okay. It's just whenever somebody takes back a message, I lose sleep. Um, so while well, you could do it in less than two years if you saved up the down payment, even if it's just 5%, you, the 5% is only for owner-occupied. So it's only if you could intend to move into that new purchase. Yep, you could do it every year if you find a good deal. Howdy, Beth. How are you? Thanks for showing up on a live stream. I appreciate it. Makes me want to go put my hat on. Yep. So, Jay, it could speed it up. The, the the caveat is, while it's going to increase demand and make us, the purpose of the video is it's going to make us wealthier if you own the assets. 5% down is not always the right choice. Where's the best yield? Sometimes it's more down. Sometimes it's less, right? Um, but it's going to increase demand because not everybody buying a small multifamily is an educated investor and not all of them are after cash flow. Some of them are after just getting on the property ladder, can't believe that they can reduce the amount that they're paying for housing. So they might not be looking at the yield or running the numbers a way that I teach to run the numbers on a house hack. Dan, Dan, howdy. Five versus 20% down when house hacking if I had 40% saved for a multifamily not out of state. One option growth, it grows your portfolio faster and the other option keeps your monthly expenses low. Where's the yield? Cash on cash return on investment. Which one's going to have the best yield? That's where I would focus. Appreciation is great. Uh, it's probably my biggest wealth building factor as far as net worth goes. 
but it's not what I focus on. I focus on yield. Which one has the, the better return on your investment? While including the fact that you're at least house hacking. The thing I've been trying to convince my friend Millennial Mike to do is he's house hacked once. So he has one duplex in the high cost of living area. And then all of the rest of his investments are out of state. If he could house hack again, because he's been there several years, he might have two or three short-term rentals here in the higher cost of living area, making significantly more with less properties. Because your question there where it says one grows the portfolio faster while the other option keeps your monthly expenses low, I'm not so worried about the low expenses. My goal wasn't the biggest portfolio. My goal was the right amount of cash flow with the least amount of units. There was actually a period of time I chose not to do this. I considered, so I'm not saying this is a good or bad idea. I considered this. Selling a property, taking the profits and paying off a couple of mortgages. So I would actually increase my monthly cash flow while reducing the number of tenants, toilets, and termites I had to deal with was a bad option. So I didn't do it. I actually made a video recently on one rental at a time. I'm going to be putting it on this channel here in like a week or a couple of days where I lost a million dollars because I paid off a mortgage. Doesn't make me want to cry. Just makes my throat tighten up and I can't talk. Well, field and journey. Interesting note on the two to 10, it's almost non-inverted. At only negative 30%, I actually looked at the average time it takes for a recession to start and it was anywhere between three and six months. Nice. Juber was right. He was a little bit early on his call for a recession. I called it early 2022, I think it was like Q2 or three, we had a dollar bet, and it hit every metric except unemployment. Unemployment didn't go up high enough to, to be a technical recession. Dan, Dan, at what year in your 10-year investment plan did rent start to fully cover your salary? I don't know that I've ever thought of that metric. I know rent covered my expenses at the seven-year mark. Well, it's when I was making $2,700 a month in cash flow. And I remember that was more than my expenses because when I was a police officer, I was making $2,600 a month was my take home. And I was able to live on that. And I had a mortgage. When I had the $2,700, it was income and I didn't have a mortgage. So seven years, seven units, seven years. Yeah. It was year eight when everything started going crazy. That was when I acquired the fourplex. And my cash flow changed by another one deal changed my cash flow by twenty five hundred dollars a month. So I did some purchases where I'd get you know four to eight hundred dollars more cash flow when I close on a duplex. Yeah, that was great in the beginning. Now each one's over a thousand dollars a unit. But when I moved from the duplex to the fourplex, so this was my second house hack. This is the power of house hacking. First one was nice. I I, I went from fifteen hundred dollars a month in housing costs down to three hundred dollars a month. So I was saving twelve hundred dollars. That's nice when you're only making 17 bucks an hour. I think at that time I was making like 18 or 19 because it had been two years since I started at the school. So I got a, a little bit of a raise. And that was before I started getting demoted down to the leadership of the company. But when I moved from the duplex, I moved out of the duplex. Here's the thing most people forget about a second house egg. It means I then got to rent out the unit that I was in, which... Instead of paying $300 a month, I was now making $800 a month there. That was my profit on that duplex. Now it's over $1,000 a unit. Owning properties over time makes the richening continue. And I moved into the fourplex where living in a unit, I was being paid $1,700 a month to live there. I was paid to live in the fourplex. So the increase of $800 at the duplex and the increase of $1,700 at the fourplex meant my overall cash flow went from uh, $2,700 a month, which was what I was making, adding $25 to $5,200 a month in cash flow. That's after principal interest, taxes, insurance, and after setting aside money for repairs, maintenance, and vacancy. Actual pure profit. And then some people will say, well, that's not cash flow. You got to pay taxes on that. No, you don't. Because of depreciation and write-offs and Congress being full of people who own real estate that keep making laws that benefit people who own real estate, I have still never paid a penny in rental income tax. So when did it replace my salary? My, well, so my salary in the beginning, I think until 2018 or 19, I never made more than 60 grand in a year. Uh, wasn't until 2020, 21, where I started making decent money at, at the company. Um, 
they realized I was financially free and didn't have to work. So they started thinking of ways to keep me. They gave me what are called golden handcuffs. I would make 10% of the sale. If there was a sale purchase, then valuation was around 20 million. So I'd, I'd walk away with $2 million before taxes. So I had $2 million in golden handcuffs that I walked away from because of financial freedom. But when did it pass? 20, I won't say right around the 10 year mark, it was about equivalent to my salary um, because, but two or three times my salary throughout the whole time up until those last two years when I started making money. It's a hard metric to answer that question. Um, a lot of new investors though, Dan, Dan will think I want to replace my salary. You don't have to replace your salary to retire. I wanted multiples of it for comfort. So maybe not retire, but to be financially independent. So you could change jobs and not worry about income because while you're working before your assets are paying for everything, you're paying the highest form of taxes. Earned income is taxed really high and you're saving for retirement. Those are things you don't have to do after you reach financial independence. So most of your expenses, everything but healthcare went down significantly after I retired. 57 max, howdy. I made a stupid mistake co-signing and now I have a 30 day late. All is taken care of except the credit mark. How should I approach regarding getting mortgage? Talk with a credit repair agency to see if you can get that mark off of there because they generally stay for seven years. But if you get a credit repair agency with the right um, process, maybe you can get that removed. Keep working on credit. It doesn't kill it. You're not, it, until you get, you know, above that 760 currently for the best lending. It's you, for years it was 740, but right now lending criteria is a little stricter and they went up to 760. So you might want to continue to work on credit scores. But I, if you have a mark like that, I would talk to a credit repair agency and see if there's something that can be done. There are some strategies that they have to help get that off of there. Wolf building, you think there's going to be a recession in Q1, early Q2 timeframe. I like how Zuber says a recession is when your neighbor gets off, a depression gets laid off, and a depression is when you get laid off. Four out of the last six recessions, home prices went up. I am most concerned when, it, when people talk about recessions, I'm most concerned with the person who only has a W-2 as their source of income. Owning assets with fixed rate debt during a recession will make the richening continue more. Buzztune, when Matt and Zuber looked over your portfolio, knew your situation, you had a lot of options. What was your thought process? How could we filter out advice with our situation? Nobody but you knows your entire situation. You give the advice to other people to let them play devil's advocate to try to poke holes. And if it's very easy for them to poke holes and you can't justify in your own mind what you're doing, then advice is sometimes something you should take. If you share your situation with somebody and they give you a bunch of advice, but you have a logical defense, not an emotional one, not a feeling, but Zuber and Matt said, I really should. This is an opportunity to take out a 50% loan to value on my paid off property, which was a mistake to pay it off because I lost a million dollars doing that. They said, take out a loan of 50%, you'll be able to deploy the funds. But based on my qu query was, I wanted to look at my portfolio, can I retire? It wasn't, can you guys look at my portfolio and see how I would get what you would want? Because Matt and Mike are growing big portfolios. That's not my goal. So their advice that said, do this and this and this, and you'll end up with their result of a bigger portfolio was easier for me to dismiss because it wasn't my goal. If they looked at it and said, wow, your cash flow is unstable, it's not a multiplier enough of what you actually need, this or this could happen, and you, you're going to be in a bad situation. If they had presented me with th things that I couldn't have argued against, I, I might have continued working or changed my strategy. But since they couldn't, they looked at it and they said, well, it takes you this much to live. You have four times that cash flow. And yeah, they had some advice on how to increase that even more. But there was no holes in the retiring uh, aspect of the question. Should I fix the map? Uh, Paula, howdy, Rob Dion. Gonna do an Airbnb like Mike so you can be demoted to maid too. <laughs> no, although it's a struggle because both Mike and I 
are frugal, right? You, you become financially free by being frugal and disciplined. One of the things I really struggle with in retirement is learning how to spend money, right? I didn't invest to create a job. I am not an entrepreneur. I invested to create cash flow because I'm an investor. If I do short-term rental, which is a possibility on this new duplex, I actually really want a long-term tenant so I have somebody to take care of my unit when I'm out of the country. But if I do short-term, I would already have the cleaning service lined up before I did it. Mike is doing this as an experiment and to make content to say, hey, this is how it works when it's your first time. And he is a do-it-yourself kind of person, but he's raising a kid. He's working full-time, works a lot of overtime. He's on the SWAT team, which has a weird schedule. I get what he's doing. That's not how I would do it. Kind of, kind of like um, my fourplex. All, so all my units, the tenants take care of the lawn. Right? It's, just, it's in the lease. There's clearly delineated yards that are fenced off. I allow pets, but they take care of the lawn. My fourplex, I don't because the, the yards aren't clearly defined, right? So I want to do it. I can go and mow the lawn. So of course I pay a service. I did not invest in real estate to go and mow lawns. Even if there are people who say, well, don't mow the lawn because you could pay somebody $25 or $50 an hour to do that. Your time could be more productive if you're looking at the next deal. No, that's not it at all. I'm going to be playing Baldur's Gate 3, Diablo 4, Starfield, uh, World of Warcraft while somebody's mowing the lawn. It is not because I can be more productive. It's because I invested to create time freedom, not to create a job. I believe Mike will come around. Uh, Drew, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate that. I just saw that. It comes down to making the right decision. It does. And there are some people who don't make decisions. They refuse to. They're like, I'm going to go to work. I want to contribute to the 401k. I'm going to just going to do my job and I'm not going to think about money. And then they're going to work very hard for money for many more years than they need to because they could have made decisions to not have to do that. That moved. There we go. Andy. Howdy. Could I also hit you up for your email? It's in the chat. Yep. To share my house hack listing with you. It's also been vacant for a while, not due to lack of interest, but strict criteria mostly. Absolutely. Hit, hit me with an email. I will look at your deals. Uh, give you, So anybody, I've shared my email in the chat. Hit me up with questions. You can do it here. Not everybody wants to ask a question in a public format, you know? So email me and, and ask questions or say, can you take a look at this listing? What I can't do is look at a property that's for sale in your area and tell you if it's a good deal or bad deal. Because I don't know your area average rents. I don't know your every area average yield. I don't know your good and bad neighborhoods. I don't know your goals. I don't know your assets or your, what do you call it? Uh, your bandwidth. I don't know enough to do that. I can take a look and tell you red flags, but it's best to ask your agent to look for red flags. I asked my agent to confirm there's no HOA, confirm it's not a short sale, confirm it's not a foreclosure, that it's not a bank-owned property. I want to buy from a person because I don't want to tie my money up for a year and a half or two years, and I don't ever want to own an HOA. So I have him look for red flags. But um, So I can't help you go, is this a good or a bad deal? I could teach you how to learn the skill to tell if it's a good or a bad deal. Curtis, we're in the same markets, Dion, so those deal deep dives will be helpful. Yep, and we so we do the deal deep dives here, and we look in other markets too. So we've looked at Dividend Dave's, we've looked at Matt's, we looked at like the six that were in his area that were on his radar. Uh, Rafal, howdy. Can you talk about Section 8 rate increase in Pierce County? So let me see if I can do this. Here's how you do this. Um, Get this in the chat really quick. Uh, if I can get it up, I will share the screen. So you're going to go to this website and I will put it in the chat. So the website looks like this, it's the fair market rents. And I'm going to look at 2024. Click here for fiscal year 2024 at fair market rents. Then you're gonna pick on your state. So you can do your state with this website. I will put this, let me, I'll, after I'm done talking about this, I'm gonna put a link in the chat. I don't wanna take everybody away from my video right now. because that would kill my algorithmness. So then I go down to the county in the state that you're looking in. 
So this is what they were paying in 2023. Most of my Pierce County are two and three bedrooms. So this is what Section 8 would pay now. They will do a 10% increase in Pierce County because they have a shortage of units and Thurston County, the two counties where I have these in. I refuse to work with Section 8 in Pierce County. They are going up to 2,800 for three bedroom, 1987 for two bedroom. They will have a thing called the floor, which could be a little lower than this. Um, the problem with this is this includes utilities. So the total price of rents and utilities that the tenant has to pay has to be this much or less. I am in a different county. And I'll just show that really quick. This is what is happening in the county where I am going to talk to the tenant tomorrow. I'm not going to 3,000 starting January 1st, but there is going to be an increase from where they're at. So let me put that in, I will pin that in a link in the description below at the end of this video, how you can look up your state and your county to see what's happening year to year. The way it works is they have a seven year uh, metric. They're going to look at the five years out of the last seven. So they don't look at the last two, they're gonna look at those previous five years. So what's happening right now is, so this is 2024, so 2017 and 18 are rolling off, 2021 and 22 are rolling in, right? So they're gonna be starting to factor. What happened in 2021? A massive rent increase. So the overall average now is going up a lot next year. Not in every county. Some counties have a small increase, but these counties here have a fairly significant increase. The richening continues. Peter Lee took back a message to also make me lose sleep tonight. Kevin, howdy, and howdy, Peter. Uh, thanks. I appreciate your content. Can you tell me how you get deal flow? All of my purchases are from the MLS. No mailers, no driving for dollars, no going to the divorce room and seeing who's there, no top county tax records, no secret sauce. Here's my order of operations for deal flow. So I talked earlier about my order of operations for lending. If you go to dontalk.com, I do have a course that goes over all of these kind of things as a process because it's really hard to go. I mean, look at this two hour video when they talked in August of 2021 about this concept that I need in the course. It's all broken down chronologically how to run your business and do this. Order of operations for deal flow. I want at least three agents, a minimum of three, with auto searches set up on the MLS. Now, they all know about each other, right? Make sure you're transparent. Give them the option to not work with you. Because in social media land on Facebook or bigger pockets forums, anytime I've mentioned my order of operations, I've had professional term coming, hards, reach out and say, oh, I would never work with somebody if they don't sign an exclusivity agreement. Right. But in real life, I've never had an agent say no, because here's what you do. You say, I'm not going to take up a bunch of your time. You're never going to show me a property unless we're under contract. All I want you to do is set up an auto search. And then whoever sends me the deal that I want to make an offer on, that's the person who gets the offer. So here's my criteria. Here's my footprint that I want. This is the asset class. And in the beginning, this is the amount that I want to look at or less. Until you've had two years of rental income, you'll have a loan limit you have to kind of consider. So you want to look at that. You have that and you have your things you don't want. I don't want HOAs, foreclosures, short sales, right? So you set up your auto search and then you're not gonna hear from me until that auto search sends me something I want. And then you have to have honor and actually make sure you go with the person who sends it to you because you're gonna have a finite relationship or reputation in the real estate investing world in your area for decades. So make sure you have honor, go with the person who sent you to the deal. But you have three because searching on the MLS is nuanced. In over a decade of giving the exact same copy and paste email to those agents, and this is what I'm looking for, only one time has those agents ever sent me the same deal within 24 hours. Yes, if something sits on the market for weeks, eventually they're going to find it and send it to me. But how they set up that specific language of their search when they do it on their end, because each brokerage has a different way of accessing the MLS, you're going to get a different search. So at least three agents with auto searches set up and then I filter through and I want my criteria looser than what my criteria is. So if I could borrow 400,000, I wanted to search for 450. If I really only wanted half of Pierce County, I looked at all of Pierce County, right? I wanted to, I wanted to be the one eliminating deals, not my agent eliminating deals because I'd rather look at a couple more deals than I need to than to have them eliminate a deal I might've wanted to go for. 
give it in, Dave, with his daily dad joke. Make sure I'm not missing any other super chats here. What do you call a clam that won't share? A shellfish. Uh, this is bad parenting. I'm probably going to get me put in jail. My son and his cousin were arguing over toys when they were kids. I'm going to teach your kids how to share. <laughs> no, I can't share. That's too, that's too much of an overshare. I can't share that on YouTube. I go to jail. Anyway, I had a teaching moment with my kids where they, they will share forever. And, and someday after enough water, I will share that. Shellfish. And then I lost my place in the chat. G. When using your cash flow calculator, it shows the first year as a negative number. Does that mean that that you would be would be considered a not a good deal? So I, I don't know which cash calculator you're using and how you're running your numbers. There's a lot of factors there. Some people will say, I got a great deal. And you go, well, how much are you paying for you know, vacancy? and capex right so your future expenses are factored there uh, how accurate is your insurance assessment your property taxes assessment all of those things right so but if you are getting a negative year number for the first year you will hear investors say i'm purchasing this as an, an appreciation play right I, i'm buying it because of that area is going to appreciate if the person has 50 rentals and tens of thousands of dollars a month in cash flow and a couple hundred thousand dollars sitting in the bank and they take forty thousand dollars put it as a down payment on a property in the middle of nowhere that they think is going to appreciate and it's not going to cash flow and they're thinking in two or three years i'm going to sell it for gains if they lost it all did they care so they're making an appreciation play which is a gamble it's not wrong for them Right, that when you get a big enough net worth, you can actually do things like Michael Zuber bought one percent of his net worth in crypto. It could take off. He could lose it all. Who cares? So when you hear that investor say, "Oh yeah, I made an appreciation play," don't compare your year one to their year twenty, and think that it's okay. When you're in growth phase, a negative return or not even a good return will add decades. Pluralize that to how long you have to work. So yeah, a negative return to me would be a bad deal. But that doesn't mean that there aren't investors out there who buy negative returns and don't do great. It's just I wouldn't do it in growth phase. Hope that helps. Wealth building journey. Our county taxes have readjusted. I have to use a nosebleed level of 2.17% for combined state, county, and local government taxes. Which, here's what sucks about property taxes. And this is, this is for all the people on Reddit who hate landlords. Yep, property taxes go up. Do you know who pays property taxes? That ain't me. My tenants do. That sucks. Jada, I love visual learning, great whiteboard skills. You know, thanks. I, sucks being left-handed on there. But that's the visual. And it will that will help your tenant understand, here's where they are, here's where you want them to be and they offered here you know it's not fair to you it's fair to them so they'll offer somewhere better <laughs> jay i rewrote the question the tam bomb howdy can i report rental income of my roommates in my primary house to start two-year requirement for mortgage loan without dti most lenders won't pay you they won't allow income on your primary house uh, if it's designated uh, ADU, they often will. If it's if it's designated small multifamily, they often will. It depends on you having leases, having the rental income, because you're going to want lenders are going to want to see leases too. So when you say roommates, is it somebody just staying with you, paying you? Are you claiming the income and paying taxes on it? Try to talk to lenders and find out what their criteria is. Uh, it's a kind of a gray area, and uh, you have completely different answers from different lenders you will get different answers from the same lender a couple months apart. It's a good way to be thinking though. Get the rental income on your tax returns. So here's an example of why it did work. I moved from my house, my primary residence, into an apartment and rented out the house. So on my tax returns for those two years, the apartment was my address, meaning the entire house was a rental. Started the depreciation schedule on the house and did things that having an owner-occupied house doesn't do. Um, 
Yeah. Again, that's a CPA question. I, I, I like that you're looking at it that way, but I would definitely go uh, not CPA, a lender question. I would talk to your lenders on how that works and then make sure if they say, well, we can do that and go, what documentation would you require and how long do you need your leases in place and all of those aspects of it, make sure that you're covered. I like that you have a house and you have roommates. I talk about this often. A lot of us, when we move out of our parents' house, we go out, we rent a place, we have roommates. We're totally fine having somebody else help us pay someone else's mortgage. But most people buy a house and then they say, I was glad you helped me pay that person's mortgage, but don't you dare try to help me pay mine. Drew, what's a good savings fund to save up for down payment? So right now you're actually getting a pretty good interest return on a lot of banks. You can get 4%, 4.5%. Apple's got 4.15% in their Apple savings, right? So you can do that. My goal actually was to never look at it that way. I wanted the, there's a theory and I should look up the name of it and know it, but it's really, it's, the theory is we are more likely to go to a store that's four miles away than half a mile away because we're going to get in our car to go four miles away. If it's half a mile and you would walk, right? So the, the, the difficulty level of it being easy makes us less likely to do it. And I'll put that in the video after I clearly get it down. Memory issues kicking in. If you have money sitting in a savings account and it's getting a really good return, four or 5%, are you motivated to buy the next rental? And I've done several videos on 5%, a 10% guaranteed return in stocks or in a savings account doesn't come close to a 5% return on a rental. Right? So the rental to me wins out on what I want to invest in. But are you motivated to go do it? So I always had my savings for the next investment until this last year in a low interest savings account. I wanted the little lizard brain in the back of my head going, you need to go buy a rental. This money is sitting here losing value to inflation. Um, so I would do something like that. I wouldn't tie the money up, you know, a CD where it's got to be in there for a year or two or five years. Uh, and then you can take it out because you might find the killer deal tomorrow. And then the penalty to take it out makes it unattractive. REI Stoners, howdy. I woke up from my nap for this. Howdy, everybody. Spent my day off renovating with a nap thrown in. Gotta love those naps. Um, next Monday or Tuesday, probably Monday, if you're available, let's get together. I'll meet at your place, kind of go through with a video with your duplex and how it's going, if you're available. Jada, you're right. That 20% gets rid of the PMI. It does. Laura Semenyago, howdy again. 68 watching and only 11 likes, hit the like button. Every time you hit the like button, an angel gets its wings. And somebody retires before Lumberjack Landlord. Matthew, howdy. Make sure I'm not missing any super chats. Uh, how would you approach an investor selling a portfolio of three duplexes if you want to use a VA loan trying to buy two of them? Thank you. So, of course, you're going to look for seller financing if you're going to try to buy more than the VA loan will allow. Maybe ask if they will sell you one now and then one in a year and use your VA loan to buy both. Look at the delineation of the properties. Are they subdividing to sell? Because if you can get a hold of them before they do that and buy them together, the VA loan will let you buy up to five units on one property. So two duplexes on a property and a house can be purchased by a VA loan. Two duplexes on a property can be considered a fourplex for lending prop, uh, options too. Kind of like when I talk about my triplex. In reality, it's a house and a duplex on one property. One of them is an ADU, I don't know which, but it's a triplex because there's three units, really that's what it means. So I would look at possible seller financing, possibly holding one for a year. Is it possible to get the duplexes on one property and one sale? Using the VA loan, is this your very first purchase? If you have other properties already and you have two years of Rental income, can you also at the same time get a conventional loan on the other one since the VA is down using your down payment to buy the other property? You have several options there. Um, again, my email's in the chat. You can email me the specifics and I can see if I can think of other things because that's kind of a unique situation. 
What I do like is Christian and Cody you know, from Cody and Christian multifamily strategies. They develop a relationship with the person, not so much with the intent to buy. Like that, that's the intent, but they develop the relationship to learn from them. How did this person get the duplexes? If they're willing to share that, then they're going to be more willing to think of ways for you to acquire the properties. That's how one of the reasons why Cody and Christian have developed hundreds of units in such a short period of time. Jada, thank you for all you do. For us little guys, Dion, you're my hero. Nobody's little here. Chenda, I have just emailed you. Okay, hope to hear from you. Dion, love your live stream. Keep going. Thanks. Awesome. I will have to check it out. T Peel, howdy from St. Louis. St. Louis, what was in St. Louis that just happened? Uh, there was something about real estate in St. Louis recently. I forget what it was. I'll have to look up. Alex, howdy. It is not about rich dad, poor dad. It is all about rich dad versus bitch dad. <laughs> At least in the rich dad, poor dad book, his dad who went to school and had a job told him, if you want to learn about money, you got to go to Mike's dad and learn from him because the government can't teach you about money. Financial firefighter. Aloha, Mark. Hope you're doing well. And Jada, also ignore that email I sent you about my credit score. You answered it for me today. Thanks. Awesome. Cool. Great. Uh, the wealth building journey, Alex. The correct term is Mitch for that reference. <laughs> uh, David Yang, do Clark County mission. Um, I, I, I'll put the link so you can look it up, David, so you can do that too, because it is it is cool. And you, you want access to that link. I'm going to pin it in a comment in this video after the live stream. So that link will be there forever. So you can always come back to this video to find it. Chenda, can you make a step-by-step -step video regarding Section 8? If it is good or bad, pros and cons. I am thinking about getting into Section 8 for my rental units. I have been getting mixed experiences on YouTube. I should do that. I have made the post many times on the positive experience I've had with it, but I have two counties, one I refuse to work with and one I work in with Section 8. So it's very county specific because of the people who get hired by the housing authority or the nonprofit in your county that runs the voucher program can be great or can be douchebags. How do I put that in a video? But step by step, I can do how to get approved, what the process is like, things to look for, what they consider a bedroom, which might be a little different in each area. That, like some areas, uh, like Siberia, where Matt invests, it might be required to have a source of heat in more areas than we have here in Washington. Um, the good, the positivity, the problems, how you still screen just like normal. You don't lower your credit score requirements. I have I have Section 8 tenants with over 700 credit scores. I have one with an 831 credit score. Uh, and so you don't lower it just because you don't have an income requirement because the state is, is the, the verified income to pay for that. But credit score and eviction status still matter to me. Um, Sam, howdy. Would you buy mobile homes? If not, and if not, why? I would. I haven't seen any that made sense. I've looked at one that really made sense. I almost made an offer on about two years ago. My brother reached financial freedom with 10 paid off rental properties. And I think six of them are mobile homes. But he's a craftsman, goes and does all the repair to fix them up himself. The problem with mobile homes, where it doesn't make a good investment for some people, is they don't have good resaleability always. Right? A stick built home, you can generally always get lending on it and you can fix things up and get lending. If a mobile home sometimes has been moved more than twice, can't get a loan. Sometimes lenders will say you can't do a loan on mobile homes if they're over 10 years old, right? The lending criteria changes so often that the year you might need to sell your specific asset, it might not be a good time to do it. If you're like me or my brother who hope that our properties perform better than collectively all of mine and my brother's marriages together because we actually want our rentals to be until death do we part, then I think a mobile home is a great investment because you're not worried about selling it. But if you're a person who does like Chris Crone, where you're going to own it for seven years and sell before the big CapEx things happen, he actually capitalizes with lease option then too. But lending isn't often available to sell in mobile homes. Not often. It's not always available. It is often available, but not always. So if your strategy could require a sale, maybe not the best investment. But again, what's the yield? 
what's it going to come down to? What will that rent for in your area? I would absolutely have it. What I would not do is want to buy a mobile home in a mobile home park. No, I won't do that. Because you don't own the property. Uh, dividend day. Pretty soon you'll have to start calling me dividend dad joke. <laughs> Probably. All that ahead. I got some commercial fisherman jokes that YouTube really would not appreciate. Yeah. I have a joke. And it's funny, I was actually helping this guy's new girlfriend this morning look, talk about her rentals. But I told a joke one time that was so bad when my friend laughed at it, his girlfriend broke up with him the next day because she couldn't believe he laughed at that joke. And he didn't even laugh at it like, oh, that's funny. He laughed like, oh, that's terrible. So yeah, the Marine in me, the cop in me, the long, the fisherman in you. Yeah, we can't tell those jokes here. But someday, in a Zoom call, we make each other laugh until we cry. Because gallows humor is how we get through things. Yeah, the beta principle or something like that. I think that's it's the region, it's the region beta principle that we're more likely to do something if there's less barrier to go through. For the small multi five percent conventional, you have to live there for a year. Right, it's owner occupied lending. Yeah, uh, Derek. Howdy. What's up? Uh, let's meet up next Monday. Okay, perfect. Text me because I won't remember. So text me and I'll get it on the calendar. Um, uh, I cannot find it beyond <laughs> the scope of mea culpa. Jason, howdy. Oh, I want to hear this joke that made her break up with him. Uh, I think, you know, like 10 jokes softer. Because you just, I can't tell. That's why I don't tell. I use sarcasm, um, but I don't do the jokes here. Uh, no, I'm not going to share any of those here. Email me, Jason. I will send it to you in an email, but you can't share it. My live stream is lasting longer than the water does tonight. Un momento, por favor. Yes, region beta. There's a better explanation of it. It's uh, it's one of the reasons why I keep Jason Saturday. Maybe it depends on who's there. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to lose people because I have that kind of sense of humor. I know when to keep it clean. Usually, although I knew every HR department of everywhere I've ever worked. <laughs> I hope that this video has made people think. If you get a chance, go back and watch the first 24 minutes of this video, the intro on how the richening continues, how not listening to the crash bros has made me so much money. Here's, here's the thing. Here's what I'll wrap up this video, unless there's any questions that jump in there. I made a video with Michael Zuber and the Lumberjack Landlord this week, laughing together, the collectively the three of us, and it's okay. We are friends. We met. We are friends. We hang out all the time, at least on Zoom. <laughs> we laughed about me losing a million dollars. I lost a million dollars because I listened to Dave Ramsey. Uh, but we laughed about it. The intro to this video, that 5% change in small multifamily is going to make me more than a million dollars growth in net worth in the next year. Easily. The person who owns assets will benefit from changes. I can't think in my entire life a time when changes happened that hurt somebody who had fixed rate debt that gets easier to pay over time on assets that appreciate and actually grow in value when inflation happens. In an asset class specifically like real estate where rents have gone up, or flatlined, never gone down since 1940 when we started tracking the data. And then changes can happen where BAH goes up. Housing authorities can increase what they'll pay for Section 8. New lending requirements can make your asset class go up in value because now there's more demand. Uh, REI Stoners, love to go over your lease agreement when you're here. Sure, I'll bring one. I've got two that I'm re-signing this week. Uh, I'm reading over it now. Curious how you do you add addendums? I actually just type them in. It's a Word document. I sent it to you so you can go in, 
change, add things. I added uh, the one place where I have the wood stove is for decoration only not to be used. The other one I put in the fireplace is for decoration not to be used because um, they weren't in my lease before, but we're at a point now where the county is saying, we don't want you to use wood sources of heat unless it's the only source of heat. And both of them have um, baseboard and cadets and one has an HVAC system. So I added that to the list. You can actually just make changes like that. Um, Wealth Building Journey, thank you for the link to my course where currently, so I haven't figured out how to change it. It's taking $100 off of anybody who joins the course. The binder course is free. And so there's no charge for that. How to raise your rents, where you get your tenant to ask for the increase and be happy at the end of it. The little whiteboard example that broke my map earlier and on demonstrating how, um, and now you guys know it's not a green screen. It's like physically tapestries and there's, there's different ones there depending on what I feel like that day while oh, they're clipped together. I can't show you them. Um, the struggle is real. Uh, Curtis, question. Thank you for that. A, for utilities, do you bill back water waste bill or include it in the rent? For Section 8, it is basically included in the rent, right? You can't charge for utilities, but if your rent can cover what that expense would be in your rent and you're happy with it, sure. Whenever possible, I have all utilities in the tenant's names. The only exceptions are I've got a couple of municipalities that will only let the property owner pay the water and sewer bill. So for those in the lease, for Section 8, yes, it's included in the rent. But all of the other tenants, it says, here's the rent. Here's the fee for water, sewer. At the fourplex, I pay for a dumpster. So the tenants pay percentage of that. So I just charge that back. With water... You have to know your local laws. You're not allowed to charge more than the utilities. So in that situation, what you would do is you would go one month in the rears. I got the bill. You pay the bill. Then that bill goes to the tenant the next month. Here was your water bill so that you're going to get collect that amount. There might be a month where you don't get paid if the tenant moves out because you're a month in the rears. Big well, Your goal is to keep tenants more than a year anyway. So by the time that's such a small percentage of your revenue, it won't matter. What I do is I've got this one where the water bill is usually around $47 a month. So I charge 55 or 60, depending on which tenant I'm talking to that for that month. And then they pay all throughout the year. And in the summer, one or two of the months, the water bill is going to be $70 or $80. I think it might have hit $100 one year. But that little bit more every month is always balanced out. So I just do a consistent amount. So if you know your rental and you've had it long enough and you know what the water is going to cost, you can do that. But the most safe, most legal in most areas is to actually just do a month in the rear, get the bill, show a screenshot to the tenant what the next meant, and that's what their rent is. So they pay that. That is a good question. And it's not that I want the utilities in the tenant's name so that I don't have to pay it. Right? I could charge the tenant and pay it. I want as many of the utilities in the tenant's name because I never want the issue where you see the meme where the landlord calls the tenant and says, hey, why is the power bill so high? And the tenant says, uh, I don't know. Come on over and let's talk about it. The door's always wide open, which means they're running the AC or they're running the heat or something like that. Uh, you know, I don't want to be thinking about what is the tenant doing, right? That them paying as many the power, gas, um, you know, all of those kind of utilities in their name makes them less likely to waste your money. Well, thank you all for hanging out with me on a Tuesday. Um, buzz tune. I, I learn a lot from people's story in the course live stream. Really enjoyed it. I, I did. I do too. I really like it because the course is everybody's on Zoom and we go deep dive into your situation and what's next and what are the mistakes you could be making. And kind of like here in the live stream, except everybody's Zoom and talking to each other. Someone else is going to ask a question that's going to tell you something maybe you didn't even think of or didn't think to ask. So I kind of like those. I look forward to talking to you all later. If you're in the course, we're doing the call Saturday. So if you go to deontalk.com, this will be what I wrap up with. The binder course is free. In the binder course, I also include my spreadsheet on income and expenses that me and my CPA created to track uh, the for tax purposes for free. That's in there. And my seller finance letter is in there for free. Uh, you can book an hour with me. I'm trying to limit that to once a week. Um, but now you can book an hour with me because I'm super lazy, but I like helping people. Um, and I just did one last week. Generally, you're going to get the booked hour and then one or two more Zoom calls after that because a couple of weeks later, you'll have more questions. Those ones are free. It doesn't cost anything. The charge to book the hour isn't because I'm trying to make money. The charge is because to book an hour to get one-on-one -on -one time, I want to make sure it's somebody who's ready to take action. It's actually going to use the information. 
So I'm not wasting my time on more people like that. Um, that's what this is for. This is for the people who don't want to pay anything, but want to sit back and learn as much as possible I'm here every week for free. Um, or you could take the course for financial freedom for the lazy person, which right now is discounted because I haven't figured out how to fix the discount. Um, and all through the month of October, every Saturday, we're doing a live Zoom call for the course. MG. Hi, Dion. I have, have howdy, MG. I have nine single family rentals, all purchased since 2020. Awesome. How many have I purchased since 2020? I think we're about the same. Almost exactly the same since 2020. Like I got a little over half my portfolio since then. Here in Houston, we have some soaring insurance costs. Have you heard if I can buy one insurance policy for whole portfolio possibly to save a few dollars? With homeowners insurance, what you definitely want to do is shop around. I've had good luck with different ones, get several different quotes and get away from the big names. I don't want State Farm. I don't want Allstate. Their, their quotes were five times what the same policy with the same underwritten company was through something like Geico. No, I use still water through Geico, depending on what's available. Get quotes often and compete with them, just like you would with lending. Or if you're going to have a contractor come and build a $5,000 deck and you're going to get three quotes, get at least three quotes with insurance. I raised my deductibles to the highest allowable level. I don't plan on ever using a homeowner's insurance claim because it can triple your rates and make it to where no one else can insure you for five years. So using homeowner's insurance is a really bad thing unless it's a complete burn down or somebody got injured and like broke their neck or something. Then I would use a homeowner's insurance. So a high deductible is possible to reduce your premiums. I don't know about the blanket. I know I have an umbrella policy, but that doesn't satisfy lenders. It means they want homeowner's insurance on each property. Uh, but I would do that. Shop for rates, raise your deductibles, keep good reserves so that you can handle the deductible if you have an issue. Yeah, and the insurance, I had an 80% increase in insurance last year, which sounds like a lot, but it was less than $100 a month. I think insurance and taxes together was less than $100 a month per property. Um, and rents went up a lot more than that. And last year was the year I did the binder strategy across the board. Um, wealth building journey. I'm going to mess up this last name. Elizabeth H. Mrs. H. And of course, it's in California. Mr. Dan, did you see the professional tenant story? I did. Yeah, I think she stayed in an Airbnb for a while and racked up a bunch of stuff. And something, what, I didn't read the article, but it's something about the owner didn't file their licensing right. So it was more like a tenant situation. Yep. Know your laws. And if you're investing in California, definitely know your laws. Uh, Jason, love the course, learn so much. Thank you, appreciate it. Chenda, skip my question regarding distance to rental property. Let me go up and see if I, thank you for the reminder, Chenda. How far is too far to buy a rental property if I am self-managing them? How far are your properties from your home? Generally, thank you for pointing out that I missed the question. I'm sorry that I did that. Because, um, and if I, if I ever miss your question, anybody, make sure you repost because I'll catch it eventually, um, or somebody will catch it. <laughs> um, and I got a bunch of texts from people. Matt, Matt texted me, hey, your banner's down, Matt, you missed the earlier when we did the banner uh, for the whiteboard and then the map broke. <laughs> Thanks for texting me, though. I appreciate it in case I missed it. Um, <clears throat> good stuff. And I'm proving that it's not a picture. It's a tapestry. Chenda. All of my properties when I first started investing were in Pearson, Thurston County, all within about an hour of where I lived and invested. If I was going to go more than an hour, generally when I was starting out and working full time while raising kids, I probably would have went the millennial Mike route and invested out of state, used property management, been more hands on. But within an hour, I was able to do it and invest the lazy way. I did want it a bigger footprint because I didn't want them all close together so that you're drawing tenants from the same economic drivers, right? You can have a port or a base or a company close down or go on strike and then all of your tenants are impacted. Right? I wanted all my properties at least 10 miles apart, so they are. I was not finding very good cash flowing deals, even watching days on market in that area. So I expanded out to hit about 11 more markets. So I'm within an hour and a half 
but I'm no longer working, right? So I have more time freedom to drive that far. So with an hour and a half from each other, I'm out in now Pitt, Port Orchard, and I was looking in Shelton, a couple of new areas outside of Pearson, Thurston County. I think an hour and a half is doable as long as you have some free time in your schedule. If you have young kids and you're a single parent and you're working 60 hours a week, I'd probably keep it to within that hour, right? So that you can, you know, two hours there and back. In a day, you can still go take care of something if you have to until you get your systems in place where it's been, I want to say over five years since I've had to go to a property. There are times I go to a property where I'm like, yeah, that's an easy thing. I'll go do it now that I'm retired. But I really like to have my handyman do the easy stuff so that they don't mind getting paid to do the hard stuff. Um, so that's how I look at that, Chanda. I hope that answered your question. And boy, Boston, howdy. With these higher interest rates, could I sell my triplex for more money doing a loan assumption? I have a 2.7% mortgage. I owe 230K, want to sell for 330. So the, the problem with loan assumption or subject to is we had almost 30 years of interest rates coming down. So lenders would go, okay, if somebody's assumed your mortgage at 5% and the next year it's 4%, sure, we're going to let you assume it. You can keep it as long as you want. Because if someone refinanced, we'd have a lower interest rate on that loan. Well, now we're in an uptrending interest rate uh, market and lenders might call loans on subject two more often than they were in the last 20 or 30 years. So loan, so lender buy-in would be important. So I get very concerned when I hear people talking about subject two. If they say, we just do this and don't tell the lender, they're going to find out. And when they do, they might call the loan. Uh, so you might get a higher price. If you want to get a higher price, loan assumption uh, is an option. I think until you list it and you see what offers come in, you might be surprised at where the price actually is. It doesn't cost you to list. I think right now, cleaner properties sell higher than properties that need work. Properties that need work will sit longer and get lower offers eventually. So if there's any kind of repairs that you can do, I think this is a market where repairs get a good return in your sales price versus three or four years ago, you could put a crap thing on the market and there was tons of offers because there was so much demand, low interest rates, prices weren't as high as they are now. <clears throat> and there's a big shift and this is why one of the reasons why real estate continues to go up over the next couple of years. And it's kind of a concept that's hard to put into words. I'm half a century old. And in half a century, 50 years, I grew up with a prolonged government shutdown, a pandemic, a big earthquake, a, gov a stock market crash. If something happens, you're going to lose everything. And in 2020, the, the I'm going to give a walking dead example here. A shift happened that very few people realized, but it fundamentally changed the entire landscape. So here's a Walking Dead reference for everybody if you've ever watched the show. How many people watched zombie movies in the 80s, 90s, 2000s? Every single zombie show was the same. Something caused corpses to come back to life, and if one bit you, you became a zombie. In The Walking Dead, this is the first show that did this, and now, like, 50 shows, not even associated with that Walking Dead universe, do this. Everyone is infected, and if you die, you become a zombie. That never happened before. That mental shift, you don't even realize it happened until somebody points it out. Right? So this is the glass-shattering moment on the change to the zombie genre. This is the glass-shattering moment in the real estate world. The economy shut down. We had a pandemic. We had an eviction moratorium. Nobody had to pay their rent and you couldn't kick them out. Hey, here's EIDL loans. Here's stimulus. Here's unemployment, extra unemployment. Here's $46 billion in rent relief for the tenants who don't pay their rent. And hardly anybody lost their properties. Less than 1% of those that went into forbearance went into foreclosure and less than those are going to actually go through foreclosures than would have in 2019. As a species in the United States, as a race of people, we are more confident in real estate than we have ever been before. Now, everyone expects a crash to happen, but the government's here to pick us up. They're going to do forbearance. They're going to do EIDL. They're going to do stimulus. They're going to 
turn the money printer on and go burr, and everybody will be okay. So people are more willing to get into real estate now than at any point in time. That's a huge mental shift. So, I mean, to construct my own segue. Sam, so, when is my next members only session? Saturday. Yeah, Saturday. I've got two o'clock bigger pockets during the boot camp. We have the office hours and then four o'clock for the course. So it's either going to be at three or at six. I haven't decided yet. Maybe, maybe five, but I don't want to rush the course. So probably three or six, probably six. Probably going to do it at six o'clock on Saturday. Pacific time. And then the members only will be up after for future land if you can't make it to Saturday at 6 p.m. Saturday at 6 p.m. Write that down. Oh, I'll remember. Yeah, no, no. I'll set that up as soon as this is over. And you were in Houston. Nice. Find out where the local REI meetups are. Candace, howdy. Hi, Dion. Finally caught you live. How is the Burr house hack going? I just got one myself looking for a good plumber. I found an awesome handyman that is a plumber. I don't know how far from you are, Candice, but uh, I found him on Thumbtack. Hire for some small jobs, learn their, their skills, get a couple of estimates. Uh, found the plumber on Thumbtack. The house hack Burr is going good. Siding has been delivered. It's going to go on. Then is insulation, drywall, paint, all that. That'll be done. Uh, and then flooring. So plumbing is done past inspection. Electric is done past inspection. I hate permits. So why is my last burr? Um, it's going well. I don't have the other unit rented out yet. I don't. I didn't plan on doing it until around January. It might be earlier than that, but I doubt it. Uh, so let me know how yours goes. I'm curious. Master Coach University. How? How? MCU. The problem with the richening is that it makes it harder to accumulate property. So when would that, but it's a good, so and, I'm going to put an and at the end here. So when one is accumulation mode, it seems that this process will slow the road for financial freedom. Are you willing to house hack? This 5% down for duplex, triplex, and fourplex is a game changer if you're starting out. Um, so yeah, it increases demand. It causes the richening to continue. Since I was born, I've never seen a year where anybody said, this is a great year to buy real estate. 2011, we're at the bottom of the market. You know what everybody was saying? 2011, I heard this every day. Oh, double dip recession. We're going to get another crash. Don't buy that asset. Stupid, stupid people talking. 2013, prices are above 2008. Everybody's screaming, oh, it's unsustainable. We've had prices this high before. Look at the crash that happened. It didn't happen because of prices. It happened because of over 50% adjustable rate mortgages, ninja loans, 104% loan to value. So you can wrap the closing costs up in there. 2015, we were going to have a silver tsunami. All the baby boomers were going to start retiring and it was going to be a flood of inventory. 2018, interest rates went above 6%. 2020, we had a housing uh, eviction moratorium and rent freeze. Every single year for over 50 years, I've heard that this is a terrible time to do this. You're going to hear a reason why now is different. But the person buying now, and so, so Master Coach University, that's a great question. I love that you posited it. Um, when I started, I thought, okay, 10 years, financial freedom. If I buy a rental every couple of years, in 10 years, I'll have five. And if, you know, when rents increases and principal pay down, eventually I the binder strategy, I switched to small multifamily. So it wasn't a rental every other year. It was small multifamily. So it became 18 units instead of 10 or five. I didn't go. I'm going to start investing. I want to be retired in two years. And so many people that I talk to now in 2023 that haven't invested at all, whether they're 60 or 30, they're like, I want to start investing, but it's so hard. I won't be retired in two years. There's no way I can do this. A friend of mine has a 24 year old daughter and the daughter was saying, there's no way I will ever be able to save more than a thousand dollars people just can't do that and i would have to save about sixteen thousand to go and buy a duplex so it's not possible in her mind because it won't happen soon enough if you're starting now you are not going to re retire in 2026 financial freedom would happen in 2030 
three. That decade is going to happen whether you invest or not. And yes, if you don't have $89,000 in bad debt, and you're making more than $17 an hour, and you're not a single parent raising three kids, it's probably going to happen sooner than 2033. But the strategy I'm teaching is for the people starting today who just found me, who in 10 years or less want to make work optional. You have to think 2033, Bill Gates. We overestimate what we can do in a year, and we underestimate what we can do in five. So remember this quote from me. This is not Bill Gates. This is me. You are going to be alive in five years. Start investing like it. Yeah, it's not going to be easy. might take you two years, two years, to save the down payment for one house hack which is exactly what I did between 2011 and 2013. Two years of overtime, playing World of Warcraft and selling things online to bank the money, no vacations, not spending money, not eating out, no dating, which is actually, that, that's a lifesaver. It's not a money saver. But to save for two years to have the down payment for one duplex, and then two more years of saving for the next one. So in four years, I bought two things. If it's 2023 right now, can you save up the down payment for a house hack by 2026? When you start adding in the element of time, it's challenging, but it's not as challenging as the thought. And I'm not saying you have this. I'm saying I've run into so many people that do. I got to do it now, right? Because we hear stories of, of Cody and Christian. Cody I had him on my channel before he could buy a beer. And he's like, yeah, I only have 30 rentals. I wish I'd started sooner. Now he's got over 100 and he can buy a beer now. Um, although I see that he's dating and that's everyone's downfall. But Mark Ashiro, financial firefighter in Hawaii, empties out his retirement accounts, right? Good call, buys 14 rentals in two years. Scales very fast, but he has some challenges. He had some evictions, some tenant turnover, some rehabs all at once. It was very challenging for him. So I don't know that that's for everybody. I don't know that my way is for everybody. 10 years might be really long and you might be in a better starting position, but somewhere between the four to 10 years, I think almost anybody can do this. But there is a reason. And you're going to hear next year, there'll be a new reason why next year is the hardest year to ever invest. So many people will say, well, the next generation is screwed. Last year, the largest group of home buyers was millennials at 43%, increased from the year before when they purchased 37%. It's a big number of them buying it. Then they go, well, then Gen Z must be screwed. No. At the age of 25, you can Google this because nothing on the internet is, is incorrect. That's what Abraham Lincoln said. But if you Google this, at the age of 25, Gen Z owns more homes than both Gen X and millennials did at the age of 25. It's easy to complain and say that it's hard. It's easy to say the next generation is screwed, but there are people out there like Millennial Mike building a portfolio, finding a strategy that works, house hacking in a high cost of living area, investing out of state, Cody and Christian with their strategy. Uh, eventually, I'm going to convince my friend's daughter to start saving because once you can save from running a business, I know that if you measure something, it can be improved. But if you're not saving, it's a fuzzy thing you never can get better at. But when you start saving something, you'll be able to improve it. I hope that answered your question. I hope it didn't sound tacky. It's just it's a great question because it's something I hear often. With high prices and high rates, we can't do it. Well, watch days on market. Make offers that are much lower than what they're asking for. Look at a 203k loan right now because cleaner properties are selling faster. Ones that need work are harder to get the, the deal done. And there's not a lot of contractors that'll work with those. But if you find one, there are strategies to do that. Most people will say, I can't have that because I'm a certain age or I have kids. And it's not like there's millions of families living in apartments, but you can buy a duplex or a house with an ADU. You're not even touching, except now you get to pick the neighbors. How bad do you want it? Wealth building journey. It was awful. She wants 100000 to vacate the property. I'll cash for keys. But the Daily Mail found out she got vacated from another property only two months prior. Absolutely insane. Yeah, that's crazy. Michelle, howdy. Good to see you here. Hopefully you'll show up Saturday for the course, 4 o'clock. Members only is at 6. Um, it's completely remodeled. Okay, yeah, there you go. 
Uh, and then I see Wealth Building Journey, talk to Masterclass University. The new flex is to become a federal politician. <laughs> it's like they know when to buy stocks before it's, yeah, some major event happens or make laws that benefit people who own properties. So weird. Go figure. Yeah. Buzz tune. Yep. Hider. When I hear it's custom, customers retiring, I ask way too many questions. I miss from Hider. Yeah, me too. Learning. Yep. Cody. Howdy. Hope to see you Saturday. JMC. Howdy. In one of your recent videos, you said it's going to be harder and harder to invest in multifamily real estate in general. Is that true? Can achieve financial freedom in 10 years possible? I said it was going to be harder to invest in small multifamily. Why did I say that? Why would I say that? multifamily? Five units or more. Yeah, it's because it's not the asset class that I choose, mostly because they don't have fixed rate debt. But harder to invest in multifamily. There's more demand now, especially with the 5% down option, which makes it easier to invest in small multifamily. If you could email me the video I said that in, if you know where it is, that would be great because I would want to know what I was thinking when I said that. Uh, I did say that every year there's going to be a reason why it is harder to invest and you're never going to see a year where everybody says, this is so easy, this is the year. We'll look back and go, that was the best year. 2011 was the bottom of the market. And if you had cash, you could become much richer. Uh, 2022, I think, according to Zuber, there was one of those years, 2021, 2022, affordability index that it was the best year to buy, second best year in 50 years, right? We can look back and know those kind of things. But looking forward, yes, I think it's possible. Absolutely. I think somebody like Dividend Dave, who's got his duplex, Josh and Mary from you know the REI stoners who just got their duplex this year in 10 years, absolutely are set up to be retired or at least have work be optional. They might be working because they like to do something. Um, we'll see. So yes, 10 years is still possible. And I think everything I just covered with um, the Master Coach University, I said that that's still possible too. And I see you says here, so the house hack is a way to leverage the richening in favor of the buy side. Kinda. When I talk about house hacking, it was a, a huge factor for me because I had a bad debt to income ratio. I had low income. I had three kids to raise. If you don't have all of those expenses and barriers and you have a high income, house hacking has less of an impact. If you can save two to $8,000 a month, saving another thousand is less of a thing than if I could save $500 a month and all of a sudden I had another 1200 on top of that, almost tripling my savings rate, right? That had a huge impact. So one of the reasons why richening is going to continue is if you have the income to buy properties and demand for those properties goes up because of products like 5% down on small multifamily, but you could buy it not owner occupied with 20% down, but now the value goes up because more people are competing for those. The richening continues even if you're not house hacking. So I'm trying to be fair. I don't think real estate's the best way or the only way. It's the best way for me, right? Stocks work better for people like Joe Kuhn. Now, he also did some live-in flips, right? And then used the IRS 121 rule to generate massive gains and redeploy that in the stocks. So he's a super smart guy. That's why I talk about watching his channel. You should be watching Joe Kuhn, K-U-H-N here on YouTube. He retired with stocks. So I don't, I don't own any stocks. I wouldn't. If somebody gave me stocks and they came with free tacos, I'd still sell them and buy real estate. And then there's starting and growing a business where you grow it where it's large enough for somebody else to run it, right? There's like all these ways to reach financial freedom. None of them are better than the other, but one of them is best for you. And for me, it was house hacking because of the barriers that I had, because of the timeline that I had, and because of the low income that I had up until the last like two and a half years. Uh, then I started making a lot of money because they knew I didn't need the job anymore. Weird how that works. D. Stewart, howdy. If Republicans win the election, they won't. Here's why Republicans won't win. win because you can't get religion out of your brain. Not a political channel. If Democrats would let go of gun control, they'd have a lot more voters. If Republicans would let go of religion, they'd have a lot more voters. And neither one will do that. I don't see, I still see it being a split government, which is good for real estate and good for stocks because a split government doesn't do a lot of changes. Not a lot of changes provide stability. So what we want is a split government. But if, so hypothetically, if they win the election next year, do you think mortgage rates will drop? Will that make investing easier? Will that increase demand? Will that lead to bidding wars again? I don't know which parties in place is going to change the interest rates. I don't think it's Republicans or Democrats. I think it's the Fed. 
this this is the best branding in the world. Okay, and this is actually something I learned and picked up and then researched and agreed with from Jaspreet Singh from Minority Mindset. So I watch all his stuff too. So there are some YouTube channels I still watch. I actually did a video earlier this week on one from Ken McElroy and Daniil, um, where I had answered one of their questions during their live stream. But so I'm still taking in content too. Uh, squirrel, what was the question? <laughs> oh, interest rates. At some point, the, the interest rates hit the government's adjusting payments, and that makes it a barrier. At some point, the economy slows down enough, because remember, the target goal is 2% inflation, which people are like, oh, if inflation comes down, things will cost less. That's not how it works. If something costs $100, and we have 9% inflation like we did last year, now it costs $1.09. So now, if we have 2% inflation, it means it costs 2% more than $1.09. Not doing the math on that. Somebody with a calculator could tell you. But it's cost more, just less than it was increasing before to where rates will come down. Now, here's the problem with rates coming down. This is why I don't want to see it. Prices will skyrocket. Now, this is what you're going to see in the next month. You're going to see some YouTube channels who think people have no memories, which seems to be the case. Every November, FHA increases the limits that they will lend on. And everybody's going to be saying the YouTube channels because it gets clicks and it gets used because it gets a thing. I'm probably actually going to make a video going, hey, it's November again. FHA raised their amounts. This is not new. It's not the end of the world. It's November. It's like every year. <laughs> like a treadmill. Keep going in circles. When interest rates come down, prices are going to go up. And that will be why people can't buy. And people will be complaining. So I don't know that it's one side or the other that are going to make prices go up or, or rates go up or down. I think it's going to be when inflation hits its targeted rate. And Wealth Building Journey, I'm going to look up housing affordability in the months and up to a year after a recession back to the 70s. I think there may be a pattern there. Except Wealth Building Journey, here's, here's my and, right? If you, if you um, understand what I'm saying here, I'm not saying but, I'm saying and. The housing affordability index is broken and doesn't apply anymore. We used to go, here's how much everybody in this county is making. The average income is this. Here's how much the houses cost in this county. The average cost is this. The higher the number, the more average people can buy the average house. The lower the number, the more expensive they are and the less average person can buy the house. In 2020, with the pandemic, we have more remote working than we've had at any point in our entire world's history. Not just like the last couple of years, but in our world's history. Over half the people I know who aren't truck drivers work remotely. I haven't figured out the remote truck driving thing yet. But with working remotely being a thing, people are working in counties that won't have the data on their income for two or three years. It's a lagging indicator. So the housing affordability index doesn't apply currently. There's even more metrics to it than that, but that's the thing that's impacting it the most right now. So you can't look at the housing affordability index and say, this is a good time to buy or a good time to invest. It's skewed. Jason, great info on the not house hacking makes me feel better about my situation. Awesome. Yeah. So that's, I try to be clear that way that Michael Zuber never house hacked. Look how successful he is right? from owning one rental at a time. Didn't take house hacking. He does say he regrets it. It would have propelled him faster. So it is a strong strategy. And for some people, like in a situation as bad as mine, it's it's like the best for me strategy. Not required. Frank, Jason, I'm curious how you mean we should connect. Jason's in the course. So Frank, you guys should definitely connect. But uh, you can see each other Saturday, too. Wealth building journey. The Fed is actually a privately held bank, believe it or not. So here's here's the cool thing with the Fed. Here's how good their branding is. The Federal Reserve Bank is not federal, doesn't keep a reserve, and, Chester, isn't a bank. We can't go make deposits there. Best branding ever. Government-sponsored enterprise. There you go. All Nighter Hider. What we need is to split government representation. What we have is a uniparty oligarchy. 
True. Curtis, have to watch the rest in Futureland. Ciao. Tacoma is meeting now. I know. I wish I could make it there tonight. I don't think I'm going to. Um, two things. One, I didn't realize until about halfway through the live that that was tonight. And second, this was full when I started and I'm not driving. And it's too expensive to take an Uber from Port Orchard there now. Go drive on water. Jason. Frank, I don't want to house hack because I'm attached to the memories in my house. I think I can afford to do it without house hacking, but the new 5% down was making me nervous. So if you could save a down payment, 20%, 25% by a small multifamily, the 5% down is increasing the demand on that asset, which is going to cause its value to go up in the next couple of years. So even without house hacking, it can still be a good purchase. The demand is what's going to make it more valuable. Okay, I'll give it one more minute for any last wrap up questions here. We've been doing this for two hours now. And remember, if you get a chance, if you came in late, the first 24 minutes, explain why the richening continues. And as we wrap up again, I will thank the sponsor of today's video, who obviously doesn't sponsor my video, Skull Vodka. They just make these videos possible because I'm an introvert. Imagine an introvert making a YouTube channel, but I want to share this information with you. So, oh, we got Bill asking, anyone find a cheap place to stay in Las Vegas in February 2024? I actually need to look. I'm going to be there for probably at least a week. Leaving for Thailand in a bit. As soon as this rehab is done, I'll be in Thailand, and then I'll be flying from Thailand to Vegas, and I'll probably be there the week before. I know that Frank and a couple of us are getting together, I think, Thursday or Wednesday. I had lunch or dinner or something. I have to look at where the blind center is because this is the one rental at a time. First, second, it's the second event, but the first one in Vegas. Celebrating Michael's Uber from one rental at a time, hitting 50,000 subscribers. So we're doing an event at the blind center in February 17th and 18th. The VIP tickets, uh, we hang out with the presenters, I think are sold out, but there are still like 100 or so tickets available for that event. I would like to meet everybody who can come and hang out. That would be cool. You're going to reach out to Skull Vodka and get a sponsorship. You should. I should. I, I, I got to somebody reach out for a sponsorship today. I've said no to almost all of them. Not too long ago, I uh, accepted the sponsorship from the Ridge Wallet. As the person who travels, the Ridge Wallet has RFID protection. It's very uh, small. It holds things together. I don't like to have big bulky things in my pockets. Easier to conceal, less likely to be stolen. Um, I scuba dive, and one time it was in my stuff that would have got wet. I didn't put it in the dry bag uh, and held up just fine. So there's my sponsorship video. Check the box. Uh, but I get oh, so many sponsorship things reach out. Um, I think when you hit around 8,000 subscribers on a YouTube channel, you just hit the radar of all the people that think you'll sell anything. What was the most recent one? Um don't think I'm going to go through with this sponsorship. And if I'm sharing my screen, ignore all of the dating app emails. Where did it go? It was. Researching, creating, and publishing low content book on Amazon. No, that is not something that the people that watch my content come here to see, I don't think. While Zuber has done a couple of books, I'm going to eventually do a book. Uh, no, I'm not going to accept the sponsorship, um, no matter what they offer on the videos to do. Putting a book on Amazon. Not that they're a good or bad product, right? It's just this is not the target audience for that. So, do not stay at Galaxy Hotel unless you like disease. So there's a anti. They are not going to sponsor this channel. Uh, still working over here. Thanks, everyone. All nighter. Awesome. I will reach out. Uh, definitely not cheap, but I'll be at the Venetian and would love to meet up Thursday or Friday. Cool. I'm probably going to be off strip. Normally, I've stayed so throughout the years. Treasure Island, just kind of dated now. Um, Caesars. I stayed at Mandalay one time but it was like a slow season and the tram wasn't running and I was like stuck at the end of the strip. 
But this one, I'm going to be somewhere close to the blind center so I can mostly hang out with the people that are there for the event. So normally I try not to stay in Vegas longer than four days because not sleeping for four days will kill you. And that is the city that I never sleep in. Um, but I think I'm going to stay a week this time. Thank you all very much for hanging out with me on a Tuesday. I will be back here next week on Tuesday. Uh, I have some videos coming out Thursday. I have the course. And if you're on Bigger Pockets Boot Camps, I'll see you uh, Saturday at 2. And if you're on my course, I'll see you Saturday at 4. Until my next video, thanks for coming to my Dion talk. <laughs>